2020 has been a year like no other. Every business has been affected in some way by the coronavirus pandemic. While some failed, others flourished. We'll take a look back at the good and bad of the year that stopped the world and discuss strategies for moving forward in 2021. Stay with us. Welcome to another episode of Ortho Thrive. I'm your host, Richie Gerzon. Our guest today has become a familiar face on the show. For those of you who don't know, Manon Newell has a unique background that weaves together experience in law, business, and orthodontics. After practicing law, she transitioned into the field of orthodontic devices and then into orthodontic consulting. Manon, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be back. So for those that don't know you, haven't seen the past episodes, boo-hoo to them, they should go watch them. But <laughs> They should go watch them. <laughs> uh, why don't you just give us a little background info from you? Yeah, so um, as Richie said, my background, I, I grew up in orthodontics really because my, my mother always worked in orthodontics. Um, she started in clinical orthodontics and then she worked with 3M Corporation for many years. Um, and she always wanted to be you know, to run her own business and to be a consultant because she was working with orthodontists every day and, you know, seeing in her mind, like how she thought she could help improve practices. Um, so I actually started working for my own orthodontist when I was 16 in the summers um, and learned how to do chair side assisting and thought maybe I would go to dental school. And instead I went to law school. Ah. Um, and so there were a lot of things along the way that kind of guided me to where I am now. Um, I enjoy the practice of law. However, um, from a career perspective, depending on what area of the law you're in, it can be just extremely high pressure, um, you know, and you're dealing, at least in my opinion, I was dealing with a lot of things that I felt were kind of depressing on a daily basis. I can um, see that, yeah. <laughs> right, and when you go into an orthodontic office, there's nothing bad there, right? Everyone that's there wants to be there. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's generally a really happy environment. And the teams that work in orthodontic offices, um, there's just so much potential there uh, from a business standpoint and from a team building standpoint. So when my mom actually launched the business and then um, I kind of worked part-time for her for a while and ended up coming over full-time as the business grew. And it's interesting because I'm, I don't think in the beginning I realized how much of my legal experience would come into play, um, but it's sort of like being in-house counsel for our clients <laughs> because yeah. I mean, any business has legal issues on a daily basis, it. primarily revolving around HR and a small business. Um, you know, this year actually was sort of like a little bit on steroids in terms of me using my legal background um, to help our clients because from March until now, we've been constantly dealing with the legal aspects of COVID. So oh, whether- right, and it keeps changing so rapidly. And like... it keeps changing. <laughs> I think that that's really unnerving. Yeah. Um, I think it's really unnerving for the doctors, for practice managers that are trying to keep up with all of it. Um, you know, and so that's been, for me, I find that interesting. I like reading pending legislation. I like kind of hashing through, uh, you know, when, when the legislation comes out, I like to sort of hash through it in its raw form and understand it before everybody else starts interpreting it. Yeah. Um, so well, thank God been... for people like you, because I know most of us, that's not something that uh, we particularly <laughs> choose to do. For you no, exactly. Um, so I think that that's been good for our clients. Um, it's been fun for me uh, because I've kind of been tapping into that more. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, when we first met and, and this had all first started, uh, it was like a moving target, right? Like we didn't really know what the protections were going to be for employees. So that was kind yeah. of the first hurdle that everyone had to get over was, you know, we have mandated shutdowns, which I think thankfully we're past that. Um, I think even as we see, and I hope I'm right about this, and but I have good news, even if I'm wrong about it, I think. 
Um, yeah. But even as we see, you know, cases rising across the country, which we definitely are. I know we are here in the Midwest where I live. Um, in fact, last week, Children's Hospital put out announcements that they're taking adult patients. <laughs> so, That's an interesting announcement. Okay. Yeah. Um, any adult patients that are non-COVID because the regular hospitals are so full of COVID patients. Um, so, you know, anyway, I, I guess my point with that is even though we see cases rising and we've kind of had ups and downs over the past nine months, um, I don't think we've seen any major outbreaks traced back to orthodontic practices or even dental practices, which is amazing. I mean, it says that everything that they're doing and all of the protocols that we rushed to put into place at the very beginning are working. Yeah. Um, that's a really good thing. And when looking, you know, my end of year, part of what I'm doing at the end of the year is looking at all of our clients' uh, performance indicators and all their numbers and seeing where they are for the year. Um, every one of our clients grew this year. That's um, interesting. I, my, I think the same is true for all of my clients as well. Yeah. I mean, we have a, definitely have a few hitting Invisalign, uh, you know, new records for sure, because they're getting the new certifications. So it's pretty exciting. Right. Yeah. So we, Today, I just two of our clients that I was drilling down on one had 18% growth. Um, and that was over massive growth the prior year. Um, one had 15% growth. And these are offices that had eight weeks mandated out of the office. So that's kind of unthinkable because I remember when we were sitting here in the spring talking, um, you remember, I mean, everyone was having podcasts and webinars and webcast and yeah. and I think like all of my clients anyway were, were sort of you know like going from because they're off work so they don't know what to do right with themselves yeah. they're norm they're they're used to seeing patients every day and having a very busy schedule so they're watching all of these all of these webinars and webcasts and I was getting phone calls left and right saying oh my gosh we saw this xyz consultant that said we're gonna lose up to 50 percent of our business this year and I said mm -hmm. Calm down. <laughs> Just take a breath. Well, <laughs> like, when you get into the game of predicting the future, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a chance you're taking 50%. Right. Um, and so thankfully that didn't happen. And, you know, I felt like, and it's kind of my nature to say, we're just going to take it a day at a time. And like, you know, we talked about, and, and you guys were kind of, you know, saying that from the beginning too, that you know, when you're, when the shutdowns were mandated, like let's start with virtual appointments with our patients, which I think was huge. For sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that I mean, we're digital. Good. So we're always looking at things from that point of view anyway. Right. So when I see the industry, like embracing something that we know is true, you know, they kind of get out of that limiting belief that they can't do it and they're forced to, I think. It, right. I so saw that, that's like another sort of silver lining this year, right? Because the technology has been there to do virtual consults and mm -hmm. um, even, you know, quick virtual appointments that save people time from having to make an appointment and come in the office. Those things can carry forward even, I mean, I don't think we're going to be in a post-COVID world for quite some time. Maybe next December, we should schedule one of these for next December. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, to see oh, or how well our predictions if we're post COVID, truly. <laughs> yeah, post COVID, it better be instead of there's might be a COVID twenty or something, whatever. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> All I right. Do so, think... um, there were definitely a lot of downsides, of course, and just generally in the economy. So sure. let's go a little bit into that, and we'll come back to the okay. positives. <laughs> but yeah, we were totally shut down. A lot of doctors were, I remember the clients were freaking out, of course, mm -hmm. but it was a good time to reflect. It was a but, good time uh, to reflect. It definitely was very challenging. A lot of things changed the industry probably forever. Maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think the main changes that we're going to see moving forward from this, you know, and just in terms of practice are creating the touch points outside of the office before patients come in through the virtual appointments, yeah. um, virtual consults. I think to me, that's probably the biggest change because like I said, the technology was there, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say that 
I would say it would be a small minority of doctors who were really utilizing that technology. I agree. Um, so I think when you have eight weeks out of the office, obviously that forced a lot of doctors into a situation where they were operating in that way, you know? Um, I think a sort of general flexibility around staffing, um, you know, this kind of goes towards what we do. So maybe it's something that I'm noticing more, but I know, um, you know, I'm in some various forums online with people in the industry that deal with kind of like HR issues, um, yeah. you know, staffing, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be like this kind of pervasive attitude in the beginning that really goes counter to everything that we believe in but which was like, well, if we're going to give people more unemployment, they're not going to come back to work. Right. Like if they're ma if people are making more on unemployment, they're not going to come back to work or. Oh yeah. That I've heard that many times. Right. Or do you really um, want those people coming back to work if they have that right. attitude? Or uh, the FFCRA, the FICRA leave. So, you know, if we're, if we're going to pay, get, you know, the people are not going to have to take their PTO if they're taking COVID related leave. And a lot of, a lot of doctors were questioning, um, you know, whether or not they should opt in or out of that. And to me, and with all of our clients, it was like, well, that's a no brainer because like trust and taking care of your staff are the most important things, right? So if you have the ability to give your staff paid time off and they're not having to dip into like their hard earned PTO that they've, you know, yeah, Why yeah. wouldn't you, to me, is the question. So actually, I think that over the course of the year, you know, there's been even increased trust among the teams that we work with and their doctors because they know that no matter what happens, whether the office is shut down for two weeks or a month or whether they have a spouse or a child with COVID or they themselves have it and they have to be out of work for two weeks, they're being taken care of because they're valued in that practice. Um, yeah, so this I, really was a great opportunity for a doctor to show their true colors there and build uh, that loyalty. Absolutely. I mean, I think loyalty and staying with one company for a long time, that's something that's gone by the wayside over the last 30 years, that's probably totally since agree. the Reagan administration Yeah, because of this, all the strikes, at least that's what I, I read that in the book. So, but I, I mean, when it comes down to it and you see your employer doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that says a lot about who they are. So, yeah. And I think it says a lot for the, um, for the team members in our practices too, because, you know, the thing that a lot of doctors were afraid of and just small business owners in general, that, well, people aren't going to come back to work if they're getting extended unemployment benefits. It just didn't happen. So I think that says a lot about the fact that at least with the teams that we work with, these are people who are happy at work, um, who love their team, are very loyal to their team. And I mean, everyone was back on day one and so happy to be back. Um, also, would you argue that if the opposite happened, you probably had an existing team issue that needed to be addressed anyway? So sort of. I would say that, yeah, absolutely. And I think that in those cases, um, you know, there were people that didn't come back that were not kind of productive members of teams. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, so in that way, it, sh it potentially could have strengthened the entire team as a whole. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but by and large, what we saw was just overwhelmingly positive. And I think it gave everyone really a renewed sense of like that excitement to be in the office every day to be working with patients. But I mean, the people that we work with all love what they do and it shows. So, yeah, so that was really, I mean, a very positive thing I think that came out of it. But yeah, Absolutely. in terms of changes, I think you're, I mean, I, I think that, I think that the virtual aspect of treating patients is probably the biggest one. I mean, what do you, what have you seen with your clients? What do you think? Uh, well, I think the idea of, uh, coming to appointments on demand as opposed to scheduled appointments. Actually one, you know, strongly considering whether doctors are seeing their patients too much just because they are really, you know, obsessed with detail. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that was a big belief that people had to get over. 
And the virtual appointments are just a tool that they could use to help with that. Dental monitoring monitoring was a tool to help them do that. Sure. You know, we had to solve these issues and technology really helped with that. But right. I think it revealed, you know, what people really want, what kind of relationship they want with the doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, we pushed what maybe we thought our ideas of what the relationship should be on them, but now the patients kind of had a chance to speak there. So for the successful practices, I think it's changing, you know. Mm -hmm. When I think everybody leads such a busy life, which actually, I mean, ironically, I think, you know, this year, it's not that people aren't busy, but maybe going in less directions than normal. I mean, yeah. you know, going to as many extracurricular activities with their kids and kind of all of that, you know, taxing that goes on with your kids between schools and activities. So it's even, you know, I think that you'll see the benefit of that kind of care more even moving forward, like post COVID, when life is more back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it suited the needs at the time, because obviously, the less people you have in the office right now, the better. Um, you know, there are some parents who are only going to bring their kids in for appointments that are absolutely necessary right now. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that it will probably grow more even as we kind of get back to normal life. So. And I, I don't think the relationship between the doctor and the patient, the importance of that has lessened. I think um, it's actually been shown how important it really is, but does it always require it person to person, in person interaction? You know, mm -hmm. you can build that relationship digitally um, if you know what you're doing and it makes a huge difference. I mean, it's just texting your patient once in a while to make sure they're okay. A lot of doctors absolutely were doing that and it made a huge difference, you know, because you're showing that you care. Um, considering automation for the first time, just so people know they're being touched, really considering what the messages were in those automations, mm -hmm. maybe having an email newsletter when you've never had one, just so people can see what's going on. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. I, I think we all saw people lean into all of these technologies. I mean, I saw our clients um, doing more with their blogs, definitely yeah. utilizing their texting, um, their texting apps more with their patients, even with communicating their COVID protocols. I mean, we had one doctor who did like orthodontics drive-through initially. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Like before, you know, the doctor had been doing virtual appointments and then when it got a certain number of weeks out and patients hadn't been seen, um, they wanted to see where the patients were. So they had did like an ortho drive through and they did QR codes. People would drive up, snap the QR code. It would tell you your place in the line and it was very efficient. And so, yeah, I mean, people got really creative. Our, I mean, our, our clients are kind of all varied in the way that they approached it, but it was, it was all creative. It all utilized technology, um, you know, and they're kind of all back up and, and running. And I think that you know, probably one of the other things that was a huge benefit for all of our practices is just increased trust between the patients and the practice. Um, I think it takes an enormous amount of trust right now, um, you know, to take your child, especially. I mean, we're all kind of more protective about our kids than we are ourselves. Yeah. Um, and so to put them in someone else's hands right now and to know that, you know, they are following all of the protocols that have been laid out and essentially creating the safest environment that they can create for your children. So that I think has also been huge. Um, I mean, in our clients' practices, we've seen a lot of, you know, grateful gestures from parents. I mean, they understand, I think, what a difficult job this is right now. Yeah. Um, you know, wearing PPE 10 hours a day. Um, you know, I know I personally can't imagine doing that. That would be very tough to do. It would be very, very proud of everyone for doing it. No, I am as well. I mean, I know I've sat in on staff meetings with our clients where it's not anyone's favorite thing to do. And I, 
I say all the time, I'm very sympathetic. I get it. Like just going into the grocery store for 20 minutes and I'm ready to take the mask off as soon as I get back into my car. So it's, a, these are long days for them. And the addition of all the PPE requirements has been massive. So yeah, yeah but yeah. They've, all, they've all done an amazing job and hopefully there's an end in sight. I'm sure. Well, let's just uh, put a nail on this, but I think we talked about PPP about a thousand times in the last couple <laughs> episodes that we were together in. So where does it stand now? I assume we're in forgiveness and there's no more money, but uh, just give us a brief overview. Um, yeah. So on the PPP loans, the most everyone I would assume has received the forms from their bank for forgiveness. I know that at least two of my clients have submitted forms for forgiveness. And with that said, um, the new legislation that is, I mean, the latest that I've heard is that they're going, you know, Congress is going to pass like a stopgap funding measure tonight to keep the government open so yeah. that they can continue working through the weekend on the new stimulus that's supposed to come out. <laughs> Hopefully. So, but... <laughs> so we'll see on Monday. Um, I do know that there is supposed to be additional help for small businesses in the new bill, but I don't think that anybody has any idea yet, like what kind of magnitude that looks like. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I feel totally disconnected on what that's supposed to be. I yeah. just hear that it's just not happening. And my guess is that it would be similar to what we saw in the first CARES Act. Um, yeah maybe something slightly pared down because I think now that we have a vaccine on their horizon, um, there's an end in sight, which there wasn't in the spring. Yeah. Nobody knew like how long this was going to go on, but you know enough to know that without a vaccine, it's indefinite <laughs> or, or until, you know, it would take a long time to reach the threshold where you would have some kind of herd immunity. So I think we may see something pared down there is supposed to be um, in this legislation the, the point that you will not have to file for forgiveness for PPP, like under $150,000, I think. Yeah. Which isn't going to really do anyone any good because, like I said, most everyone that I know has already filed for forgiveness because it's no one has known whether or not they were going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> which is <laughs> really, sense. again, like the story of 2020, right? Like, uh, nobody knew what any of the rules were for the PPP from the beginning <laughs> and it changed over time. It even changed after funds were dispersed, which seems, I hope unprecedented. It's not, I've never heard of anything like that. It really? I mean, it's almost, it's very easy to get forgiveness now. It's almost like, yeah, there was no real rules. Right. It's just but I mean, it. even after the fact, like the percentages changed on how much of it you could use to pay staff versus. Yes. Um, yes. Pay. Yeah. We were right in the middle of that when deciding. Yeah. What should we, what should use this for? Because <laughs> exactly. you got it just in case. I mean, seriously. Right. And so I think, you know, I would like to think that it's gotten better, but I'll say whatever legislation they eke out over the weekend, hopefully, I would assume that it's going to be more of the same. One thing that I haven't heard about, and, and this is something that I would say, like in terms of wrapping up business for the year, because a lot of our clients uh, yesterday was their last day for the year yeah. in the office. I think it's really important for doctors to, com um, to communicate with their staff right now about FICRA leave, because I think this isn't something that some necessarily that people are thinking about. So do you remember like the FICRA leave is the leave that applies when you have, you meet certain uh, COVID related um requirements. So it could be that you're caring for an immediate family member that has COVID or you have it, or you have a child whose school is closed, something like that. Yeah. And then you would have those two weeks of paid leave. The employer gets the 100% tax credit to pay for it. And then there's like a two thirds pay for an additional 10 weeks. If you, that would mostly apply, like if you truly had a child whose school was closed and you had no alternative. Yeah. Um, but let's say somebody is taking, because in all of our practices, there's been someone on FICRA leave probably at least twice in a month um, because, I mean, everybody's getting COVID. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, for sure. 
Right. Absolutely. So someone has it or there's someone in their family has it. Mm -hmm. um, so if someone were to take their FICR leave like on December 28th, even if they had never taken any of that leave, the two weeks since March, that will still sunset on the last day of December. So they can only take whatever is available up until December 31st. Gotcha. So if they went out on the 28th, it would only be whatever work days between then and the 31st, and then it expires. So we don't know if there will be new FICRA leave. I have not read anything saying that there will be. So I think that's where we kind of talk about, you know, trust and communication between doctor and team. Um, I don't know that most of the most staff members are going to know this, like the FICRA is expiring because it's certainly not going to change in January and February, probably especially that mm -hmm. there are going to be a lot of COVID related, um, you know, leaves of absence from the offices. So then that becomes a conversation about is the doctor going to cover that kind of leave? Like if there's no FICRA to like part two. Yeah. Um, are they going to dip into their PTO and then not have any vacation time? Um, you know, so there are a number of kind of creative ways I can think of to handle it, but it just, I definitely think that that needs to be something on everyone's radar because it's not a conversation that really needs to be had in January. It's one that needs to be had this year, just because I think it will be a total oversight and then January will come and people will be out with COVID or need to be out for someone else as it, and they won't know what they're, you know, they won't know what they're dealing with in terms of leave. Um, so you I think it needs to be something formal or just understood? The doctor just needs to make an internal decision? Well, I think it needs to be a formal conversation just to inform the staff that, you know, this federal benefit is ending. So. Yeah because every, everyone this year has known that they've been able to take that time off and not have to dig into their own PTO, which has been an amazing benefit. Um, and yeah, it's just sure. not gonna be the case next year. So um, again, unless something changes, but I am of the mindset that I would want everyone prepped for that. And then whatever the practice decides, however they're gonna handle COVID related leave. I mean, maybe the only option is that they're going to have to take their stored PTO, um, or you know, there there could be a number of creative kind of solutions to how that could be taken care of, um, but it just has to be clearly communicated and applied consistently to to every employee. So that was just something when you said let's talk about kind of the end of the year, and I thought that's something that people are not going to think about. I mean kind of it's speaking of increased prices and pressure on the bottom line obviously we have all this protective equipment and sterilization equipment like the procedures are causing an increase in expense right what do you think how should doctors react to that should they consider raising their prices so we just suck it up what would you in your opinion would be a well, good uh, so strategy? actually i think doctors have had a lot of resources at their disposal to cover the extra ppe costs um they've had the hsa grants that you've been able to apply for um and i off the top of my head i know that i have i think all but one of our clients utilized that grant um and that was available to any like healthcare providers um, it was a percent, I think it was based off of a percentage of your income from the prior year. So it was a fairly substantial amount of money and didn't have to be paid back. Yeah. So that was one. Um, and then another is a lot of insurance companies are automatically reimbursing like a PPE stipend. Um, so let's say you get your, your normal insurance payment, if it's quarterly, um, for patient X you would see a line item on their EOB showing you like a PPE stipend. It might be $7 per visit. So then you would have like a $21 stipend on that quarterly insurance payment. So several insurance companies were doing that and they were doing it automatically. So you didn't have to actually file a claim for the PPE. Um, some of the other insurances were requiring 
like I know MetLife was one, you, they will pay a PPE stipend, but you do actually have to file a separate claim for yeah. it. So I think that in that sense, in terms of insurance and billing, that's something that everyone's financial coordinators should be really in tune with and know what's going on. So at um, least for this year, it really hasn't affected profit, let's say, because of I that. Don't, you know, I don't think so. I think in general dentist offices, probably more, even though they had the same they had the same benefits available to them, but it seems like from what I've seen and in my own personal experience, like a lot of general dentists are charging um, PPE fees, adding them yeah. on to the appointment. It's not something I would do in orthodontics, honestly. Um, I don't think that the additional expense, if you did the HSA grant and you take the insurance stipends, I honestly don't think it's an expense I would pass on to patients. That makes sense. Okay. I kind of agree with you, especially with all that help that's available. Yeah. There's a lot of help available if, if people took advantage of it. What would you say to a, a practice that isn't doing virtual uh, consult consults and <laughs> meetings? Like they still kind of been holding out, you know? I would say like, what are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> I know it seems... Uh, to me, I mean, we're digital. We do a lot of digital stuff, so it seems a little silly to me. But I know people don't like to change. But I, well, I feel like you're putting your practice at risk if you're not going to adapt. You know, I think you are. I think you're putting your practice at risk. I think, you know, I can see both sides of this. So, like in the work that we do, we're very hands-on. Um, you know, and actually working with you kind of forced me to do Zoom more than I would have. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, it's not something with most of my clients that I'll say, oh, hey, let's hop on Zoom. And I think a big reason for that is most of the communication that I'm doing with a doctor is either happening in the car on the way to work or on the way home. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. Because their day is so packed with seeing patients. You know, there isn't a lot of time, maybe texts mostly during the oh, day. Oh, yeah. I have a lot of lunches that I skip here so that I can. Yeah. With them. yeah. And lunches too. Yeah. But so Zoom hasn't typically been something that is utilized. So, I mean, for us, we've had to change too, because we're doing virtual workshops, things that we would have normally done in the office. And I think where I probably, you, to be honest, I think I was a little resistant to it as well, but now at the end of 2020, looking back, I'm wondering like why I wasn't doing this because it's saved on travel expenses um, there are still going forward, there are still absolutely going to be times where I want to be in person with my clients. Oh, I absolutely agree. Like, I don't mean to suggest right. that that's any less important. I almost right. feel like it's more important. We won't take it for granted anymore. We'll you know, it kind of granted. treat it as a exactly. special thing. Exactly. But I think, you know, the big thing that orthodontists were worrying about even before the pandemic was you know, like why do some patients kind of, why are they going to choose to go to like a smile direct, right? Yeah. Or, or that type of, that type of service. And I, I have my own thoughts about that. A lot of it is cost-based, but I think you can't discount from a business standpoint that there are, there's a certain um, demographic of patient that really just wants convenience, they don't want to have to have, have an in-person appointment, you know, every eight to 10 weeks. Um, they want their trays mailed to their house or, you know, whatever. And I think that demographic by and large, if we take out the cost factor, I think it's by and large, you know, young working professionals, they're super busy, right? Mo I mean, even parents with their kids, it's like an orthodontist appointment is sort of like a soccer practice or something like you'll figure out how to squeeze it in. Yeah. Um, you know, cause you do all, you do that for your kids, but when it comes to yourself again, I think that most, most young adults are, um, you know, put themselves on the back burner. So if they can tap into that kind of convenience, I personally see it being the biggest draw for that age group, like probably twenties to forties you know, adult patients. But I mean, COVID has changed people's behavior so much, you know, how many people probably never picked up groceries 
like, you know, I did the pickup at Walmart, for instance, right. or the grocery store. And now, oh yeah, that's normal. Or got groceries delivered. Right. I can't do it because I live in the country, but I definitely use the pickup once yeah. in a while. It's great. It is great. I mean, that's changed people's behaviors. I mean, I never used butcher box until this year. And now it's, am I ever going to go back? Right. Like, no, why would I? Right. Like, it's better. It's easier. It's more convenient. More efficient. Yeah. yeah. I but think I mean, everybody's looking for ways to save time. I think part, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, there are some things I can't predict. Like maybe people are going to enjoy in-person appointments more after this. I don't know. I have heard that is happening from a few of my clients. Almost <laughs> to the degree that, hey, I'm not here to entertain you. This is a doctor's <laughs> appointment. I know you've been stuck in your house for two weeks, but we're at it. They're having like an appointment right now. Therapist. Yeah. <laughs> Like we're not, this is not like taking the kids to Disney World, <laughs> but really um, <laughs> I don't. That direct, I think it's not that hard to com, to compete with a direct to consumer model. You can be very convenient and still have a traditional practice. I mean, like we we're saying, you know, appointments on demand is a great option because you're coming when you need to come. The technology is telling us when you need to come to the office. That's something I think everyone sh could should consider. Mm -hmm. You know. Am I seeing my patients too much? Am I making it as convenient as possible? Are we using technology when we should? And we're using right. in-person appointments when we should. Because um, it's just changed. People's expectations are right. different now. I think, you know, most of our clients, they, they have their appointments are spread fairly far apart um, because of the technologies that they use. They don't have to see people as frequently as maybe they used to. You always have the non-compliant patients who you see more than you want. Of course. To. And they <laughs> might, the technology might tell you that they need to come in more, which is right. just as important because it's, if they didn't come in, it'd be all this time. Right. You so, know. <laughs> you know, I, I think there's a way to like, to really marry the two, the two ideas into like a, a greater whole. So yes. being able to offer patients more convenience, more efficiency, being able to check in with them very quickly in a virtual type of appointment. Um, you know, I think that it, it will be really interesting to see how they move forward. I think there will definitely be a subset of doctors who will drop this technology, like once we're kind of past, e even some probably have after the original shutdown. Yes, I've noticed that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll, I think, that will be a major distinction between practices moving forward. I think the practices that will be the most successful will be the ones that are able to, you know, take both ideas and put them together, like to use that technology to benefit the practice and at the same time offer really excellent customer service, really excellent patient care in person. And so, I think the blurring of those lines is really actually good for the industry in general because yeah, I would from agree a with that. consumer's point of view, you know, they're just looking at cost versus benefits, you know. Right. And I, I personally would still want a relationship with a doctor for something yeah, that's so important. You know, absolutely. But I mean, and that is the main distinguishing feature between our practices and, you know, like a smile direct. Yeah. I mean, they have a doctor that they have met, they trust. So I think, you know, that not in the pandemic, that was a really sort of backward situation where people were doing initial consults, um, you know, on a virtual platform and then later coming into the office and meeting the doctor. So I sort of think that technology will be flipped. I mean, you may do initial consults just to see if somebody's ready to see an orthodontist, like a quick evaluation. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I think that, you know, real initial consult should be in the office where you have FaceTime with the doctor, um, understand their treatment planning, but then the way that the virtual, you know, appointments can be weaved into the course of their treatment to make their treatment more efficient. Yeah. Um, I think that actually is the biggest benefit or will be the biggest benefit. Yeah. I mean, building that rapport and trust, especially it's just like meeting anyone in real life. It's the same. Right. This is why when I'm evaluating someone's website and 
I don't see a team page and I see no testimonials <laughs> or maybe I see a bunch of written testimonials that I could easily fake and then no video testimonials. Um, there's the pictures are five years old. You know, these are all things that are stopping someone from getting to know you and the practice before they walk in the door because you should be warming people up so that you're not starting from totally cold relationship right. when they walk through the door because that initial I mean, there's so many people are just looky lose. Like, is my kid going to feel comfortable in this office? Do I like the doctor? Right. We want as many of those people to convert to starts as possible. So, you know, it starts maybe with the digital brand. They've seen mm -hmm. you to even, even make the decision to come through the door. But, you, you know, when they walk through the door, every single thing they see, touch, hear is like changing their perception about you. It's either reinforcing what they saw online or right. it's just showing them that, oh, what I saw online is completely not <laughs> right. true, not authentic, exactly. which could go either way. You could have a horrible online brand and you're actually great in the office. Right. I wouldn't say that's good, but at least you've got one side right. of it, right? It's, it's you have not doctors that have a great online happening. brand and then. Right, what's happening in those scenarios is, and I actually think that's the more common scenario is that you have people with very outdated websites mm -hmm. that are not a true reflection of who they are. And then you go in the office and you're like, oh, wow, like this is not what I expected, which is yeah. great if you made it to the office and you're there to be pleasantly surprised. But what's not great is that they're losing so many potential patients. Yeah. And it's hard for a doctor to see it because they're only that. seeing, they're only seeing the positive effect. They don't realize that they've missed all of these other people and they would even had a chance to you exactly. know, share their story with them. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's critical there. I, and the online presence, I mean, all of that is critical to be, to bring people in. I think, I definitely think that, you know, will not think I know from looking at some of our clients website, you know, analytics, the number of patients that kind of kept in touch on their blogs, um, on their social media, like, you know, for information about COVID protocols to, you know, office hours and what was happening during the pandemic. Um, the people that had really great websites and communication platforms with their patients, I think that was like at an all time high, their interactions with patients. Absolutely. And I mean, this is a good time, I think, for people to take a look at their patient management software too, just because mm -hmm. it all needs to kind of work together. We just talked with Gray Finch and to be frank with you, I didn't know much about them, but after we had our interview, you know, I was really impressed with what he, how he's thinking about everything. Yes, I, I mean, think he's, Jake is very forward thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of doctors need to just see if it's working for them. I know it's so, and I'm not saying Gray Finch is where you need to go, but right. is whatever your system is, is it working for you? Is it mm -hmm. going to work with all these other technologies that you know you need to have in order to give the patient the experience that they need to have? I think, you know, we kind of have some interesting insight into practice management software um, because we have clients who use, I mean, we have clients who use Gray Finch. We have clients who use Tops. We have clients who use Cloud9. Um, clients who use OrthoTrack. So it's, it's a, you know, across the board. And with the work that we do um, with our clients, I mean, we're in their practice management software daily. So yeah. I have used most of, you know, most of the practice management softwares that are out there, I have some experience with. The biggest problem that I see, not with any one practice management software, but it's that practices are trying to combine a lot of different technologies that are separate yes. and to make them all work together. Um, that to me is the biggest issue that we have so many. And I think this is true across the board. I've yet to see um, anything that's completely brings it all together. But, um, you know, these systems don't all communicate. So you may have like a new patient management system somewhere that you, um, you know, create contracts and you get patients to sign up and maybe it allows, you know, patients to sign up remotely for treatment. And that's a huge benefit. 
but it doesn't actually sync up with the practice management software. So then you're back to like a manual system of, you know, importing information from one place to another. It's the same with some of the texting apps. Some of them have really good ones um, that are integrated with their practice management software. Other ones are outside of that. So, uh, you know, I mean, I would like to see more streamlining on those fronts. Absolutely. I agree. And I think it's an opportunity for anyone who's either creating this, these uh, systems, upgrading right. them, or someone who's looking for a new I one. could create the best practice management software. Oh, yeah. You would know at least what it needs to do. You see? I know exactly <laughs> what it needs to do. <laughs> um, but I, I think you want to get those efficiencies. You really have to always work on efficiencies. Even if you're killing it and you've got all the marketing down, you've got as many new patients as you want right. now, how can we be as efficient as physically possible? I mean, that's exactly. All right. So let's go straight into all we were talking upsides of 2020. There's a lot of, I think, changes that are going to help us in the future. Like that, obviously the adoption of technology mm -hmm. is one of them. Understanding the patient better is another. And just the fact that we've both seen our clients grow. I think that's a huge opportunity there. Huge. There's a, cause if we're growing now, how are we going to grow when we have more certainty? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, uh, you exactly. don't are, have to worry about this crazy pandemic, right? Exactly. I mean, I think, you know, the fact that we had huge economic issues related to the pandemic, I think we're going to still see that that's going to, I mean, that's not going to go away overnight. Yeah. Um, there are still going to be a lot of people losing their jobs. Um, but, you know, I think what this year showed me was just that in the face of, you know, extreme adversity, which this was, and everyone was very panicked in the beginning, that everyone got very creative. Um, all of our clients, I think, were very open to ideas, um, you know, to implementing protocols, whatever it was, it was just all hands on deck. And so I think it shows you the power of like when a strong team comes together, what they can accomplish. Yeah. Because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense really that there's this kind of growth in a year like this. It just doesn't. Um, I know because it can't, it cannot possibly be all due to the stimulus money because it just doesn't work out. It's not I mean, enough. The math, the math doesn't work <laughs> yeah, out. It's something else. Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. you know, exactly. even if everyone used their whole check to get braces, it still doesn't work out. No, it doesn't work. I think that it was a lot. Um, you know, it was a huge benefit that COVID doesn't. Not that it doesn't affect children, but by and large, most kids, you know, don't get deathly ill from COVID. So yeah. I think, you know, if this was the polio pandemic or something like that, orthodontists and pediatric dentists would have been in much worse shape, right? So I think that oh, was yeah. definitely kind of advantageous. I think that next year, I, I think if I drill down further into my clients' numbers, I bet we had less adult patients this year in terms of starts. Uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. I'd like and, to and I I'll think ask that my you'll probably that. see more next year. Because what I've heard in general dentistry, which we don't work in general dentistry, so just from, you know, in, in groups that I'm in and so forth, um, I mean, they've really struggled this year with keeping their patient load even keeled. Like, you know, they have had a difficult time with staffing, knowing how many hygienists to keep on board. A lot of people are telling them, like, call me back next year. Like, I'm not coming in for a cleaning this year. Yeah. So I've, yeah, we work with a few startups just recently because they've just asked and like, sure, uh, we'll help you out. And, um, you know, you aggressively have to be using digital marketing. You can't yeah. do it the old way because it is right. tough. It's very, very competitive out there. So I think kind of based on that, I would expect to see growth next year, like in the adult patient population. Yeah, I think that's where. You know, I'm always thinking about from year to year, like where, where will we get more growth in any given practice? That's really, if I were thinking from a marketing standpoint for next year, 
that would be my marketing focus because I think there are probably a lot of adult patients that put off getting braces this year or, or aligners or whatever mode of treatment they're interested in. I have a feeling that there are a lot of them sitting on the sidelines and just waiting um, yeah. to feel more safe. Um, and I think, you know, by late spring, early summer, uh, we're going to have a vaccine program that's reaching, you know, not just essential workers and, um, you know, I think more, pe more people in the general population will be vaccinated and people will start kind of going back to normal in terms of going to the dentist, adults going to the orthodontist, all those kinds of things. But people will still be used to virtual appointments. They'll still be used to telemedicine in general and just the right. benefits of that. So those behaviors will change. Exactly. And I've also seen, to your point on to marketing strategy, I'm always like to say, let the data tell the story. You know, where is exactly. the data? And when, when everyone was locked down and all of a sudden they need to email all their patients and guess what? I've only got 30% of my database with emails. Uh, maybe <laughs> I should fix that. Right. And like, you know, when everyone came back, you tell your staff, if you get an email for every single person that walks through this door, <laughs> you know, or like half of your list is patients and the other half is, you know, non-patient, non-starts, and you don't even know the difference of who they are. Right. I think a lot of doctors came to realization, I've got to get control over my data because if you don't Absolutely. have, if you don't have the data, you can't pull the reports and you can't make smart decisions. So, Absolutely. you know, what this did you treat more kids than adults? Can you pull that up in right. 10 minutes or less, you know, or do you have to dig in there and kind of guess? That... Or, that's the biggest problem I will tell you from our perspective when we start working with a new client, it is lack of quality data. Yeah. Um, you can run a report in any practice management software platform, but if the numbers that went in are garbage, you're going to get garbage out. <laughs> and Absolutely. that's what we see um, over and over and over again. And it's not you know, necessarily anyone's fault, but it may just be a strategic kind of hole that they didn't realize was in their practice. Yeah, until you've got to rely on it. it, it's not really a top yeah, of Yeah, from, <laughs> from everything from like how they classify appointment categories to changing patient statuses. So like you said, you might be sending out mass texts, but the text going to your active patients should not be the same as a text going out to prospective patients. Oh, absolutely. Especially if you want to run a promotion, how much of a nightmare is that? You have a bunch right. of patients calling you that want to uh, <laughs> right. Take discount. Advantage. <laughs> <laughs> discount <after the> <laughs> Let's <not do> that. <laughs> right. So yeah, th I mean, that's a, I mean, that's an absolutely huge thing. And you're right in terms of marketing. Um, that's something that we've always talked about. You need to know who you're marketing to. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. you should be marketing to all of your potential patient um, population, but, you know, for us over time, we can look at a practice and say, oh, like, you know, your aligner treatment started to dip in, in the last two quarters of the year. So that probably means we need to spend more marketing on older teenage patients and adult patients. Yeah. Those tend to be. You know, I mean, even know. something as simple as sending a survey and just asking, which is insanely valuable to anyone listening to this. Mm -hmm. You can't send them the survey because like, your data is bad. You can't even get the, <laughs> you can't get the, the new data to make another decision. Exactly. Exactly. I would definitely encourage everyone to take a look, especially now is the perfect time to do it. It's the end it of the, the year. Just dive time. into it, see what it looks like, and maybe make some processes to fix the new data coming in if you need. And exactly. if you need any help with either one, one of us can help you. Exactly. <laughs> Whether it's in your patient management system or you you're You really should do this again next December and see if the prediction is correct that there are gonna be more adult patients, more aligner patients. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think you're right. Kind of review how the technology rolls out in 2021. If everyone continues down the path, I think most smart doctors will. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, one other thing that's slightly off topic, but just that came across my radar is I'm thinking about this vaccine and what employers are going to do about that. 
um, somehow the vaccine was politicized before it ever existed. <laughs> no doubt about that. <laughs> so, I mean, our clients are in the business of healthcare. So, you know, are they going to require employees to be vaccinated? Are they going to encourage employees to be vaccinated? Like kind of what does that look like? So because orthodontic teams are technically considered healthcare, they're not going to have the same priority as obviously, you know, our frontline healthcare workers, nor should they, but they are going to be further up the kind of priority list of people who will have access to the vaccine. So that's yeah. just something else that I would encourage everyone to be thinking about how, you know, my preference is not requiring the vaccine. My preference would be educating and encouraging. Um, yeah, to, I I hesitate to give advice on this because I know my personal beliefs are not necessarily everyone else's, but to me, let the data tell the story and make, you're an adult, make your decision, you know? Right, I, but it will affect- Luckily, we're in America and the data is out there. Right. Even if you have to dig, you can get to it. Right. Um, but it's, you know, people being able to find the right kind of, you know, like legitimate data about like the safety and, and all of these things. And so I just think, you know, you could require it. There's absolutely no doubt about that. You could require it. Of course. Yeah. Um, there could be some legal exceptions, you know, um, that you would have to make for people under the ADA or like title seven of the civil rights act, um, things like that. But, you know, I just think from a team perspective and a trust perspective, I think the easiest way to go about it is actually just giving your team very clear cut information, being there to answer questions. Um, when the time comes, providing, um, you know, access for them, making it easy. So, oh, yeah, of course, you know, it's critical. I mean, I know in the past doctors have done flu shots in their office, things like that. So it's just something to keep on the radar. I don't think anybody's going to be dealing with this issue in January or February because there's just simply not enough vaccine yet. Yeah. Um, but sometime in the spring, it's something that everyone from a business perspective needs to think through how they're going to handle that. Um, that would be maybe my closing thought about 2020 would be not to kind of, you know, any anytime we have a heads up and we can start to plan ahead. So whether it's FIC relief or how we're gonna handle vaccines or whatever it is, start planning now because we all know, you know, how awful it is to be in reactionary mode, like during the shutdown. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? for sure. But, Yes. Making, Maybe a disaster plan would be a good yeah, idea. Yeah, right. So, you know, <laughs> crisis PR. You guys yeah. need a crisis PR plan. Yeah, so, wherever people can plan ahead and think about the things that we know for sure are going to happen in 2021, there certainly is a lot more, at least seeming certainty than there was six months ago about many Absolutely. things. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. I think everybody's in a much better place. We all see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that we're going to see growth next year and just, you know, renewed team effort and teamwork after they got through this year. Cause I know all of our teams that finished yesterday are patting themselves on the back and, you know, looking forward to going into a new year with some hope, I think. Yeah. I was just, we were just talking in the office. What are the uh, ra year wrap up videos for new year is going to look like, because they're always so emotional. This one is going to be that times like a hundred. I can't wait to watch all of it. I know. <laughs> it's going to be so inspiring. I, know. I for one will be very glad when this year is over. It's been enlightening. I think we've all learned a lot and grown a lot as, you know, yeah. business owners, as professionals, as just as people in general. So I think that 2021 holds a lot of promise for us both personally and professionally. So yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is the year for Ortho Sales Engine at Ortho Thrive was born. I think that was super amazing because I remember when I, think I was first mentioning the idea to everyone, they're like, what do you want to do? It's like, yeah, we're doing this every day. <laughs> Every day, every day, yeah, every day for 30 days. <laughs> We're like, what are you talking about? It's like, we got to do something. We can't just sit around. <laughs> There's no other way to start a project. Yeah. And I've never been, in. I'd never been in front of the camera for more than five minutes. So <laughs> not that I'm great at it now, now but it's at like least nature. relatively comfortable there.
Right. Yeah. So we're this is our 35th episode, our VR season finale. That's amazing. We're on IMDb, if anyone didn't know that. So if anyone wants to be a guest and you think it fits, okay. get on IMDb. So definitely reach out to us. Okay. Yeah, Rich did that. That was really fun. When he showed me that, I was like, what did you do? Like, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, you've been on, this is right. your third episode. You by far have the most views too. I mean, oh, we're wow. talking about people. That's yeah. shocking. Well, I'm, yeah, absolutely. I hope I provide. Oh, the fourth episode. Excuse me. This is the fourth episode. Wow. Oh, is it? Is this yeah. the fourth? That's wow. awesome. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've enjoyed it. You pushed about. me out of my comfort zone as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, when you have as much knowledge as you do, we have to share it. I mean, what choice do we have? Oh, thank you. People need to know. I try. I try my best to be helpful, and I think I've tried, like most people, just to make sense of everything as it's unfolded, which has been kind of, you know, dizzying at times. So yeah, yeah. I think next year we'll be able to talk more about the business of orthodontics. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? And less about the pandemic. We were just getting on the stat nostalgic over some of our trade show appearances. Like, you know, as much right. as this is not super fun to set up, I miss talking to everyone. Yeah, just, I miss you know, seeing everyone. I haven't been in person with a client, it's been over a year now because I had done things in the last quarter of last year. Yeah. And all of this happened so quickly. Um, yeah. I haven't seen most of my family in nine months. Have really? No. Yeah. I guess we're in South Carolina, so we're probably inherently more risky, but <laughs> just well, no, I'm in the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we did, but I'm just, yeah, we I'm definitely, really most of our clients are Zoom and Zoom fatigue I learned is a real thing because there's some days are just, I just need to sit down. It is it's real. Too much. Well, um, man, and thank you for being on the show again. And I think you. we're going to, we're actually are going to talk more thonic business next time you're on. Okay. We're going to really go into that. 2021, I'll come back. <laughs> and uh, we're definitely going to mark us next December and see what, how our predictions were right at all. I think Absolutely. They will be. And uh, we'll keep sharing the data, of course, if things change. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, happy holidays to you. Thanks for yeah. having me. Yeah, absolutely. Take care and stay warm out there. Okay. Thanks. See you You're next welcome. time. Bye-bye. Well, that's it. The last show of 2020 and what a year it's been. If you haven't had a chance to check out orthothrive.com, spend some of your break doing so. We now have nearly 200 articles covering a variety of marketing, sales, and tech-related topics, and interviews with some of the top executives in the world of orthodontics. Thank you to all those who have participated in the show this year and have tuned in regularly to watch. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or you have a suggestion for a future episode, please contact us through orthothrive.com. If you'd like to reach out to me personally, you can email me at richard at orthosalesengine.com. From our team to yours, we hope you have the happiest of holidays. Keep grinding, keep thriving, we'll see you next year.